Corn School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Integrity Herbicide and Pride Seeds. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Corn School. Uh, Plan 2021 is not too far off, and as farmers get ready to head to the field, uh, we're going to take a few minutes today to talk about research and offer some tips for uh, on-farm trials this summer. Um, for some advice, I'm joined by one of the uh, corn industry's leading researchers. He is no stranger to uh, field-scale trials. I'm very pleased to be joined by Purdue University Extension Corn Specialist Bob Nielsen. Hi, Bob. Hey, great to have you back on the Corn School. Well, thanks for having me, Bernard. It's uh, it's I'd say it's interesting only because we're doing this, we continue to do this virtual. So uh, I guess I can say it's a pleasure to be here. I prefer to be in your studio live, but you know, it is what it is. Well, hey, let's uh, let's let, let's take it one step further. Let's head to the field and talk about some things okay. we're going to do the, this summer. Um, let's start it here. Um, why do farmers need to do on-farm research trials, and you know why is it important to do it well? Well, you know, research. The only reason we do research is to answer questions, and there's just a lot of things we still do in agriculture that there are often not black and white answers. Sometimes there are questions that uh, the researchers at the in public institutions and industry have not even asked. Um, so there's always opportunities. And what's really driving it now is the fact that so many of us have the precision ag technologies in our farming operation that simply allows us to do both good, well-designed trials, but also well-designed trials that are logistically simple. And that's what the beauty of it today versus, say, you know, 30, 40 years ago when I started in this business. Hmm. I want to talk about some tips on, uh, you know, that, you, that, that growers can take to the field this year when conducting on-farm trials. And, you know, you can test everything from nitrogen rates to seed populations, starter fertilizer rates. But where do you start? Um, you know, do we need to be able to have a question we need to answer or a hypothesis? Yeah, I mean, I, ideally, that's the way to start because the identifying the question, identifying your hypothesis will also then help you identify what are the logical treatments to have in the trial. And so, and, and it almost sounds like it should be easy to come up with the, the question, but sometimes it's a pretty difficult thing because the one thing we want to avoid in, in these on-farm trials is having too many treatments uh, because sometimes it can balloon and just get out of hand. And so forcing yourself to identify what is the question I'm trying to answer will often help you uh, sort of fine tune that possible list of treatments that you want to include in that trial. Now, how big does a trial need to be, Bob? And how often do you need to replicate it across a field? Well, I'm sometimes accused of being a land baron by some of my colleagues because basically I go after uh, whole field trials uh, and frankly, the, the bigger, the better. And, and now I say that within reason because most of our field scale trials range from, oh, usually no less than 30 acres to typically no more than 80 acres in size. We've had larger trials and we've had smaller trials, but that range of 30 to 80 acres is sort of a sweet spot because that allows you to look at a reasonable number of treatments, usually five or six, and enough space where you can replicate them, oh, say three to four times in a field. So we're looking at those kinds of sizes of the field, uh, which then allows us also to, to use some of the plot sizes that you may ask about here in a bit, but it allows us to use the plot sizes that we're after also. So Bob, what about field length here? You know, how long uh, do those passes need to be? We generally prefer the entire length of the field. Now that's partly for logistical purposes. It just makes it easier if you're using field length. Uh, that way you don't have to mess around too much, you know, during, inside of that length. Uh, but also we've, we've discovered over the years that if we take, say, a, a long field and then break it into maybe three or four shorter segments and maybe squeeze in three or four plots in a single pass, we actually find that the statistical quality of the data that we get at the end of the day is simply not as good. So we prefer whole field length passes uh, and the individual passes themselves typically run about twice the width of the combine header. Uh, it 
can vary depending on what other equipment is being used in the trial, but typically it's twice the width of the combine header. And we do that because we prefer to harvest the middle combine header width of that plot. And especially when we're doing a nitrogen trial or, or anything where there might be some edge effects from the neighboring treatment, we want to avoid that when we're harvesting the data. So we'll take the middle combine width for data and then the alternating in-betweens are simply bulk data and we don't use them for the trial and we work only with that middle part of the plots. Um, Bob, how does technology contribute to the success of trials? And you recommend uh, you know, using variable rate technology and auto right. steer where possible. Right, well, I should probably preface it by saying the first technology that enabled us to do start doing these on-farm trials more easily is the yield monitor itself uh, because that allowed us then to move away completely from using uh, weigh wagons to weigh the plots. Now we still use weigh wagons or something like that to calibrate the yield monitor before we start harvesting but once the yield monitor is harvesting then the field is simply harvested like is usually done and and frankly it's um, very very little logistics for the farmer. Now the other technologies like variable rating in particular, if you're doing a nitrogen rate trial, if you're doing a plant population trial, well, the beauty of that technology then is that someone like me can design the trial ahead of time uh, with the software and get it all to fit the field and get it set up and randomized and replicated, all that complicated stuff that the grower doesn't wanna do, I'll do that ahead of time. And then uh, the last thing I do is to export that uh, from the software as a prescription file that we then hand over to the operator who uploads it to the display in their uh, tractor or in their machine. And, and in the instance, say of, uh, let's say in the side dress nitrogen trial, uh, once that prescription is uploaded to the variable rate controller, then the farmer simply side dresses the field and all of the rate changing is done by the black box of the controller. Uh, and the farmer doesn't have to worry about it. All the replication, all the randomiza randomization of the treatments is being done by the black box, and all the farmer does is side dress. And so that really simplifies those kinds of trials where we're using something like rates. Now, Bob, how often uh, do we need to test? And I ask that question because, you know, we often hear that, you know, multiple years of data. Some people have right. one year of data. How much data is enough? One year, two years, three years? <laughs> There's never enough data. That's the answer. And the, and the reason I say that is when we're researching these agronomic choices, these agronomic strategies, what, what we're trying to find out is which of these practices uh, have benefit most of the time. And by most of the time, I mean practices that do pretty well no matter what the growing conditions. Well, if you think about it, that means we have to somehow test them in a range of growing conditions in order to know whether they're consistent. And that's why we sort of get anal about either getting a lot of locations of testing in one year or uh, testing over multiple years. Usually it's a combination of the two. Now, when we're doing, for example, all the nitrogen rate work that me and my colleague have done here at Purdue over the years, uh, we eventually ended up with over 250 individual field scale trials over about uh, an eight or 10 year time period. And we did them all over the state. And what those 250 trials allowed us to do was to break down regions of the state where maybe we had somewhere between 30 and 40 trials in each region and then that allowed us to uh, one, look at the data and look for that reliability and that consistency and come up with some recommendations on a regional basis within the state that we were comfortable with. But it takes, uh, in any one region of the state, it takes 30 or 40 trials. And when you're like us and we're dealing with the whole state, well, then that's why we end up with a couple of hundred in order to feel confident about the guidelines and recommendations that we generate from all that data. Hmm. Yeah, a final question, and that is for growers who are doing those on fields themselves, and obviously maybe in some mm -hmm. cases with help from people like yourself, Bob, you know, um, you can collect a lot of data uh, on these sites. And uh, what do you need to be mindful when assessing and analyzing that data? Maybe there's some spots in the field and some other areas that you, you really yeah. need to account for. 
Yeah, and and again, that's the beauty of the yield monitor data is that when, like in Indiana, I'm sure you don't have this in Ontario, but but in Indiana, we've got wet spots in the field due to low lying areas that are poorly drained. And often we end up with either lower yields in those areas or sometimes zero yield if it completely killed out the crop. Well, if that wet spot is affecting one or two of the treatments, but not the other treatments in the trial, you can see how that would unfairly uh, bias those uh, plots that had that big wet hole in them versus the other. So what we do at the end of the day with our GIS software is we look for those kinds of weird or problematic spots in the field that may unfairly influence one treatment over another. And we literally just uh, highlight them and delete them from the data set. And that's sort of what we call cleaning the data. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily do that kind of intense cleaning if it was simply a field uh, itself, you know, for my own purposes. But when we're doing research, we want to make sure that there aren't some things going on in the field that are unfairly skewing the results one way or the other. And so, again, that's where someone like myself, who's got the experience and expertise with the software, is really important at the end of the day to help not just process the data, but do some of the data cleaning and then eventually take it into the statistical analysis when that's where we're trying to figure out how much of the differences we're measuring in the field are due to the treatments and how much of it may be simply background noise in the field that has nothing to do with the treatments. And that's why we do statistical analyses. Mm -hmm. Well, Bob, uh, hey, some great insights. And uh, as always, we thank you for dropping by uh, the Corn School. Uh, again, thank you. And we wish you luck with your trials uh, this this summer. Hope you there'll be no washouts or <laughs> no spots in your fields. Right. Yeah. Well, we're, we're anxious, like I'm sure you are up north, to get this season up and running. I think partly because we're coming out of the nasty COVID year and it looks like it's starting to wind down a little bit. So I think we're all anxious to get out and, and be a little bit more normal than we were last year. You said it, sir. You said it. Oh, look forward to being out in the field. And uh, as I say, uh, thank you for stopping by today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.